So without further ado, I wanted to introduce my guitar name, James. James is actually the, the president of the Inland Empire down at the group. And uh, you did a great presentation. So you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Clapping now in case I suck and then you don't have to do that for us. <laughs> Hi, I'm James Johnson. I'm the founder and president of the Inland Empire.net users group. We meet in San Bernardino. How's everybody doing? Pretty good. Um, I'm also a member of the Telerec Insiders Bureau. They pay my expenses to go and present to local user groups and stuff. And so I just like to give them a shout out. Um, like I said, founder and president of the user group, four-time and current Microsoft MVP in client application development, software developer by day and a serial entrepreneur by night. My wife's always catching me buying domain names. So, so who's using JavaScript? About half of them. Okay. Cool. And how long do you like using it? No, not really. Yes. Not a lot of yeses. There's a lot of no's. <laughs> so with JavaScript, you use it to do interactivity with your website. Um, you can get programmatic access to the DOM, the document object model. It's dynamic. It's weakly typed. So if you're used to C sharp with IntelliSense and strong types, then you're going to have some issues. Um, it's prototype based so that you can extend functionality of it, kind of like a, an extension method in C sharp or MP. And it supports closures and higher order functions. It's not new with Java, but it does have similar syntax to Java and C sharp and some of those other curly brace languages. It was released in 1995 as LiveScript, and then they renamed it to JavaScript. And during the, the buildup of the web, before the dot-com boom and during the dot-com boom, if you needed a JavaScript function, it was really easy to go and search for one and then copy and paste it into your own code. I mean, it wasn't really cool to do that, but, you know. And so it really became one of the popular web languages for web development. But the real programmers thought it was a kiddie language because it was dynamic, it's weakly typed, and blah, blah, blah. But then when Ajax came around, then the real programmers could see what the potential was, and so they started using it as well. So the pros and cons, the pros are that it's dynamic, it's easy to develop with, easy to debug, and it has a similar syntax to what we're used to. The cons are that it's dynamic. It's easy to develop with. However, every browser seems to have its own JavaScript engine. So it rent, so each browser will render your JavaScript in a different way. Um, in the old days, we used to be able to test for, I mean, you test for the user agent stream to see what browser is using, it is using your code. And then you could branch off like that. And then you got into um, checking to see if, if the browser supports this type of functionality. Like um, Netscape used to have layers instead of divs. So you would check to see if document.layers, then you know you were in Netscape. If not, then you knew you were in something else. And, but it's because of all those checks and everything that you had to do, it made writing with JavaScript really painful unless you were lucky enough to like work in a corporate environment where everybody was on IE6 or Firefox or whatever. So it's difficult it's really difficult if you're writing just straight JavaScript to have the same behaviors across multiple browsers. There's going to be some differences. So once JavaScript started becoming more popular, a lot of libraries were developed and released. Um, open source, people contributing back to the development community. And 
what it did was it, it it allowed you to write your job your type of JavaScript against this framework, and then the framework would handle all the browser irregularities and all that kind of stuff. And there's just a ton of them. Dojo, Google Web Toolkit, jQuery, all kinds of stuff. Um, some of them, I don't know if they're st still around or not. I'm sure they are. But what's nice about using a library is that all the function, you know what the functionality is. It's not a hit or miss. There's usually a well-documented API. And um, so you know what this framework is going to do when you call this method. So jQuery was released in 2006, and it quickly became the tool, the framework to use in web development. Um, it's easy to understand. It's easy to work with. Um, the syntax is, is, is just a dream. You and it handle your events, you can create animations, modify your attributes, you can do Ajax, you can you can get stuff from the server, you can send stuff to the server, you can do conditional loops and logic and just all kinds of stuff with jQuery. 39% of the top 10,000 websites use jQuery instead of one of these other other libraries that are here. 39%. And I just checked that last week and that it was like 39.2% or something like that. So it's pretty current. Microsoft got into the game and they started bundling jQuery with ASP.NET Ajax and ASP.NET MVC and they fully support it as well. So if you're working on your JavaScript file, your JScript file, and you can't find the answer, you can't get it to work, you can open a support ticket with Microsoft, and they will help you. I don't know how much it costs to get a support ticket with Microsoft now, but it's expensive. So the benefit of using jQuery is that the development time is really fast now. Once you once you get a handle on what the basic methods are, it's really easy to get start to get started working. It's just very solid. Well, there's a lot of contributions. In fact, Microsoft is contributing back to the jQuery library as well. What's nice about using jQuery and other frameworks as well, but we're going to keep talking about jQuery, is that if, um, if there's an error on the page, then it just fails gracefully. Nothing, you know, you don't get a big error message, your page doesn't blow up, it just nothing happens. So that's really good for your, your production environment and when you are um, you have something to release because then if something happens, your user's not going to see a big error, but it makes it hard to develop with. So I'm going to show you um, the tools that I use when I'm developing with jQuery. There's tons of examples. It's really easy to grok. All the cool kids are using it. And um, there's also a a dash vs dot dot js file that if you import that as a reference into your JavaScript page, then you get full jQuery IntelliSense in Visual Studio. So that makes it really handy. How many people have used jQuery before? Well, okay, so how many okay, how many people have not? Okay. Just trying to figure out how how to go through this stuff. So the syntax for jQuery is um, dollar sign open parentheses. What do you want to find? Close parentheses. And you find stuff by ID attributes, or by class names, or a combination of both, or the tag type. Um, if it has a class or a specific class, if it doesn't, all that kind of stuff. So if you look on line three, dollar sign pound my element gets you the only element on the page that has that ID. Um, on web pages, you're only supposed to have one ID. Um, you can't have two 
divs with an ID of my element. So it only returns the first one, or the one that I can find. On the next line, you see div, which references you want to find that all div tags, and then dot my element. So it gets all the divs that have a class assigned to them of my element. It's really easy to go up and down the DOM to find your stuff. So on the next line, div.mainuli finds all the line items within the div that has a class got main, a class called main. There's some shorthand that you can use, div.main.find, and then find your selector elements in that div. So that could be line item, it could be span, it could be paragraph, it could be image, anchor tags. Anything in here, it will find. You can also add filters to that as well. So that last line finds all the, all the line items that are within that div, but only returns the odd one. You can also switch that, you can say even, and so it only turn the even one. Or you can pass in a number, um, colon EQ five. And it just returns the fifth element that was in the containing element. So you can find a whole set of document elements, and this is just a brief, a brief list of the filters that they have. If it's a checkbox, if it's an input, if it's a radio, um, if it's even, if it has, and has is cool because you can say div dot my element has a p tag. So we'll only turn the divs that, or have that class of my element that also have the paragraph tag in. Um, my class is even input colon checkbox that returns all the checkboxes that it finds on the page, or submit, or button, or text. You can also down here. You can say input, this is old school, this is kind of like uh, from a CSS selector. You can say input type equals text, or type equals radio, or type equals, equals checkbox. This, this syntax is a little bit more clean. So then once you find your element, jQuery stores that in memory for you. So you don't have to go and find it again. So because every time that you say dollar sign something, it has to search the DOM again for that element, even though it just found it on the first line. So if you see here, it's saying hide the div that has a class name of my element. Then set the HTML, the inner HTML of that div to hide add the class red, and then fade that in. So that's four times that I search the, the DOM for div.myl. But what you can do as a performance thing is to chain your events. So this line here is exactly the same as here, except you can see that the, the methods are chained together. <coughs> This is another list, not complete, of all the ways that you can traverse your DOM. Okay? Children gets all the child elements that are within your selected element, and you can filter that down as well. So if you had a, a div that had a couple of unordered lists and a couple of paragraphs,
you can traverse through those with the each command, each method. That loops through everything that you found, and then you can do stuff to those individual elements as well. Find gets all the descendants of an element. Again, you can pass in a p tag, a div tag, an image, you know, whatever you want to. And I find that find is faster for me. Closest gets you your first matched element. Has is another filter. So if we look back at this example here, down here, dot my class has a p, has a p tag. So that's going to, again, that'll, that'll, that's another selector that you can use. Is is cool um, because you can use it, say you have a whole bunch of checkboxes on your page and you want to find only the ones that are checked. Then you could say dot, you know, checkboxes dot is and then in this is, the parameter that you pass in there is colon check. So it returns all the elements that are, that are checked or all the elements that have a success class, or all the elements that um, have an image tag with a alt attribute assigned to it. Once you find the element, you can do parent and parents, whereas parent is the immediate parent of that element. Parents is everything that's in the DOM that's, that's a parent of it as well. And again, you can pass in more selectors. So everything that you see here, you can pass in more selectors. So we've got siblings, which are all the, well, siblings of the element. Next is the, the, the first, the first next element that's there. Previous is the first previous element associated with the thing that you just selected. You can manipulate the DOM um, very easily. You can do some really cool stuff. You can add a class, you can remove a class. You can append content to an element. That's what you do with append. Or you can like create a new element in jQuery and then append to your selector. So say you have a div and that has some stuff up here, you select that div, and then you want to create a new div just below it. You can append to. You can take stuff out of the DOM with remove. Dot .val and dot .html gets and sets the value in the HTML of the selected element. So if you have like a, um, a, a, an element on your page, you, after you've done some stuff, it says success then you could modify the inner HTML, the HTML of that element by, you know, passing in the user's name, and the date and time, or you just selected 37 records, or, you know, stuff like that. Dot prop gets all the prop, gets a property of the element, and with that you pass in the name of the property that you want. Um, so, like, you could pass in dot prop, quote, ID, and it will return back the ID of that element that you selected. Attribute.attr is the same as property. Um, prop came out in uh, jQuery 1.6, I believe, and they're recommending that you use prop instead of attribute now. And then in HTML5, you can, you can set data elements to, as an attribute of your, of your tag. And I'll show you that as well. So um, you can get you can get the value of that data attribute and do some work with that. Again, there's just a short list of the events, but everything that you can do in jQuery, you can do in or in JavaScript as an event, you can do in jQuery. And the main ones are like click, hover, focus, select, stuff like that. And there's three ways that you can get those, that you can assign an event to these elements. The first one is using the document.ready function, 
which fires after the DOM has completely loaded. So you know all your elements are in the page. Maybe they haven't displayed yet or not because it's still downloading images or video files or whatever, but all those elements are in the page. So then in this dot ready function, then you can, you can have your selector and then say dot click and then do something. You can either continue writing your function here where it says do something, or you can call another method another JavaScript function as instead. It just depends on what your preference is and how you want your page to, you know, how you want your JavaScript code to look for re readability, maintainability, and stuff like that. The problem with doing myElement.click in the document.ready function is that maybe you have an, um, a blank unordered list when the page loads, but then you have a method that goes and populates that unordered list with a bunch of line items. Well, those line items weren't in the DOM when the DOM loaded, so if you said line item dot my class dot click, do this stuff, nothing's going to happen because they haven't had their click event assigned to them yet. So what you could do is as you're building your list of line items, you could add the click event there, but that can be kind of time consuming. Or what you can do is you can use the live method, which just sits there and then every time that element has been appended to the DOM, then it assigns that click function or that key down function or that event to that element that you just created. And then the last one, and as of jQuery 1.7, they're recommending this is the most way, efficient way to do it, is to say dot on, and then pass in as a string the event that you want to use. So click, mouse, or hover, focus, blur, double click, whatever. <laughs> Any questions? When is this one being fired? The top one is when the, the entire document is ready, and the bottom two are when the element gets created. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I, the last just, just for space, I, I, I didn't it's put the this document.ready in there. So this, this line would replace this line. Oh, okay. Is there a clock around here so I know what? Something I can see. Michael? Huh? Okay. All right. Um, so the effects that come with jQuery, you've got fades, you have slides up, you've got hide and show, and you have animate. Um, with, with your fades and your slide up, you can see in, in that one of the parameters you can do is you can pass in a function to, have, to, to be called when that fade is done or when your you're, you're building an accordion list. And when everything is slidden up, slid up, yeah, slid up, then do something else. Or you can just call it, call it um, directly. You can pass in the length of time that it's supposed to take, that this, this effect. So you can pass in like a 500, which is half a second, or you know, 5,000, or they have some defaults of fast and slow that you can use. The animate method is a way you can create your custom animations, and what it does is it goes and it, it works on a map of CSS attributes that you pass in. The opacity, background color, font size, borders, all that kind of stuff. So if you have something that, that, that's going to take more than fading in or sliding up, you can create some really nice animations with it. So who's using Ajax in your work? Okay. Are you using jQuery Ajax or something else or roll your own? It's okay, I won't steal your secret. Okay. So jQuery Ajax has a full list, a full boatload of stuff that you can use Ajax with, or you can Ajax for. 
Um, the Ajax is your main method. Um, pass in if you want to do a post or a get, or you can say dot get, which automatically just gives gets and dot post. Um, dot serialize is pretty cool because it steps through all the elements that are in your form and then creates a query string for you based on the name of the element and the value of the element. On jQuery Ajax, asynchronicity, asynchronicity is always set to true by default. If for some reason you, you, you wanted a synchronous request, you could set that to false. Um, it always caches the results, and the cache is, is configurable. So like if you're getting a, if you're populating a, a drop-down list of states, you'd want to cache that because we're not going to be adding any more states in the lifetime that the user's on your website. If you're going to post something, you can set the content type. The data is the actual data that goes to the server, like, like a, in a query string, the, the post values. Data type is important um, because that is what is the data you're expecting back from the server. Is it going to be XML or JSON? Um, just a string, whatever. Your type is get and post. In some browsers, I don't know which, you can also do a put and a delete, but other browsers will crash. And if you're gonna do puts and deletes, I mean, you can, you can do the same thing with gets and posts. And then the URL is you know, where, where this um, call is sent to. You can add some other methods as well. Um, so like if you have one of those little really things, you know, loading animated GIFs. So dot Ajax start, you can show that. And then on Ajax stop, you can hide it. And then on success, if, if everything worked out really cool, you got a 200 return value and some data, then you can do some other stuff with the data. So this is an Ajax call to get a list of states and then do something with it. So I have my URL up there, what the method type is, if it's get or post. I'm expecting JSON to be returned back to me. And then on success, I have this function that then I want to do something with that data that just came back. And in this case, I have a text field with an ID of state, and I'm, set, I'm using the jQuery UI widgets, which I'll go into a little bit later, called autocomplete, and then setting the source to that data that came back. Make sense? You guys can ask me questions. You can interrupt me too. Okay. Well, when you just had the success, what about error? You can also. You can error. say error yeah. as well. Yeah. So, so uh, no, that source colon state list is an option for the autocomplete method. You understand? Okay. So I was in San Francisco last week giving this talk, and um, they ragged me because I was in PowerPoint too much. So I put this sample together. Um, the ultimate all you ever need website gets all your data and stores it on the cloud, so you never have to go to another website again. So. I'm going to register and go through some tricks here. First thing is that uh, I send my first name, last name, email, and a password. And you can see as I tab into the field, the error message goes away. 
I didn't put any password checks for length or complexity, so I'm just typing in pass. Say next. Now if I want to receive packages or let the internet know where I live. What's that a reference to? Months. Yeah. Okay, so now this is the autocomplete box I'm going to show you. I typed in a C, and of all of those elements in that source that I defined, anything that has a C, it will find. You can say A. I'm just going to go on and just say California. Next, you know, how do you want to interact with the site? By email, by phone, yeah, and show all my contact information. What do you like to develop with? You know, you can step through, C sharp. I mean, we've all seen these on the web. Or you can say all, or you can say none. What are your platforms? Say next. Now you have this confirmation page. You know, make sure everything's fine. If you want to change something, you can go back. Or you can say next. Got terms and conditions. Say, so pardon? It's bacon Nixon. Okay, so I just registered for my site. Excuse me. Yes. Well, that looks nice. Why would I use that over ASP login control and uh, panels? Mm. Speed. Is it just graphics? Speed. Is it Speed. graphics? What? Is it? Well, I mean, the uh, user interface. Is it just uh, visuals? Yes. Okay. Just elements. I mean, you could do the same if you want to. Um, it's just really a matter of preference. Um, Although if you, you know, if you're using your controls and your panels and stuff, every time you go to the page, you have to do a request to the server. Whereas this was all done just on one page, hiding showing some disks that were already there. So your responsiveness is going to be a little better. Yes. The control of the space was text box. Yes. This is an input field. So. Could you type a different thing if it's not in the list when you find? Say that, I'm sorry, say that again? When you type in the state, is that like CA in the California book up? Could you like type in something completely which is not predefined in the list or would it uh, yes. ignore it? Yeah, you can do that as well. So, So in the state, I could say Alberta, like Alberta, Canada, and then that value is going to show up. So Graham, we got it. it's not exclusive. You can configure it that they can do. They can't just send them whatever. They have to choose. Is it configurable? Sure. Oh, yeah. It's very configurable. You can specify only the list or mm -hmm. the, li the list is just yes. to help. <coughs> so you can see here has the, the value that I passed in. Yes? The colors? Oh yeah, all everything you see here is, is done in CSS in terms of the layout. Um, and if you go to jQueryUI.com, they have their themes that you can you can they have a library of maybe twenty five different themes, or you can go and you can tweak those as well to match your CSS.
Uh, as far as uh, data, data validation is concerned, let's say if you don't want to use the JavaScript, for example, to do regular expression, mm -hmm. pattern matching, with uh, jQuery, uh, that's something that I've never done, to, to do regular expression. Um, Can you do that? I'm trying to think what kind of methods you would use for regular expressions in, in jQuery itself. Can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, there is a the form validation JavaScript jQuery file that you can use that validates just about everything that you can think of. I didn't put this in here. I just because I wanted to show you some other ways of validating. That also accept uh, uh, regular expression. Uh huh. Yeah. In fact, I'll show you in just a second. Okay. So. Yeah, and when I, I created this new MVC project, so it brought down uh, Knockout and Modernizer and all those kind of things. If you're not going to use it, you can just get rid of them. Okay, so let's look how this page is built. I have a, a master page. I put all my scripts at the bottom. So these are the scripts that I'm using. I think in, when you are done and it's in production, I would use a, a CDN okay. because those are you, know, you can get edge selection, you know, based on geolocation of your of your user. Okay. For development, I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to use the CDN, and I was started working and there's like everything stopped, and I couldn't figure. I thought, oh, I wrote some bad code or whatever, and I couldn't figure it out, and then I realized my internet connection, internet connection was down. So it wasn't able to hit the CDN to get the JavaScript from the jQuery files. But well, let's assume that we use the CDN, it is always backward compatible. But if, if they add new feature to the new releases, we know that for sure it's not going to break our existing code. <coughs> no, you can't say kind that. Kind of. Because if because they come that's, out that's with... That's one concern, you know. True, true. The CDN is usually going to have the latest code. And I believe the jQuery CDN, you can specifically tell it what version to get as well. Not only the they always yes. do, yes. Yeah. Sure. And they keep it quite back hot. Right. But the testing CDN. for backwards compatibility is going to be your responsibility. Well, let's say you, regardless of the CDN or whether you have it, let's say if you just change, uh, uh, change it to the latest version, mm -hmm. you have to go through the existing code for all the incompatibility that might come up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't really found any issues with with jQuery, and when they come out with a new release, it, I haven't seen it break anything on written in another version. So they're pretty cool that one. But you should not rely. Pardon? You should not rely on that. They even say that you should test your <coughs> Oh yeah, absolutely. Before you upgrade. Yeah. Okay, so if we look at, if we go back to this page. So it's just an, an index page. Everything here is on index.cshtml. And then when I click sign up, it's going to show this dialog, which is referenced by this div with an ID of form dialog. Then I have an actual form. I have some 
hidden input fields for doing some things, like demo state, you know, if I wanted to have it true or false, it will show different things. Then I have these different divs. which represent the different steps of this registration wizard. Here I have some more divs that are going to be for some other things in the demo. Okay, so I open up the... In this case, uh, NBC is not really playing any part because everything is happening on the client side. Yeah, with the exception so, of one thing, which I'm going to show you. So let's look at the jQuery. Um, the dash vs doc file that I was telling you about, you make a reference to it, and then when you start typing, you get all the jQuery options and methods that you can use. Um, it's incredibly hard to do. Um, but you need like a PhD in computer science in order to do that. <laughs> All you do is you take that and you drag it in. Whoops. There. And that's all you got to do. Then you got your intelligence. Pardon? Um, it installs it in the scripts directory. If you see here, I've got all my jQuery stuff, some funk, some plugins that I might be using, the Microsoft JavaScript files, and then my own Where did you get JavaScript the, file. Pardon? Where did you get all the um, script files from? When you cr when I created this new application, okay. it puts them in there. You can also go to project. Uh, yeah, you can go manage new get. Um, here, I'll show you real quick. Okay, this is okay. Yeah, I'll start playing with this one. It's nice. It's you know it's beta, so you know it's yeah. kind of slow in some places and things. So I'll create a new project. I'm going to make it an NBC application. Who chose three instead of four? Any reason? Um, NBC four is still in beta. It's not. It's not. Hasn't been released yet. And the NBC four stuff that they add some um, asset manager things and bundles all your JavaScript and CSS and and. Um, but then it makes it hard to debug. So I three, then it's fine. Because I'm just interested on the front end right now. Unit testing? Yeah. Um, it's as easy as unit testing any other thing. There's um, JSUnit.net, which is a unit testing framework for JavaScript. Okay, so I created my new application. So I've got my content, controllers, blah, 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 the scripts. Okay, so the MVC brings in the script. Yeah, when you create the new application. Okay. Okay? Oh, that's all I want to know. But if you notice here, it's calling jQuery 1.6.2. Whereas on this one, it's using 1.7.1. So then what you do is you go to, you bring up your new get packages dialog, and you say, you check for updates, and it goes out, checks, make sure you're using the latest stuff, and then you can update. Okay. On the 11 version, beta version, you still bring the Microsoft Ajax library? Mm -hmm. Because they said that they, they were going to discontinue that with the 11. Mm, that was in, well, this is a 3.0. Oh. The template for the NBC. Yeah. Yeah, I see. I see. You can delete it if you don't want. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So 
this is the this is the JavaScript file that runs what I demonstrated. So you can see the document dot ready. So when the, the document is done loading, I'm going to do these things first. Okay. I have a global variable dollar sign dialog because I'm going to be using that a lot. So I, the first thing I do is I set that variable to this form dialog, which is this div, which holds everything. Next one I'm going to do is I'm going to find all of the text fields that are in that dialog box, and then I'm going to assign a blur and a focus event to them. That's what this is doing. Mm -hmm. What's the advantage to use find instead of the selector? To use what instead of the selector? Find. Instead of using just the select button, put it in. Mm, I'm not quite sure how it works on the back end under the hoods. It's just it's faster. Um, because you could, I could say, because I know they're in divs, I could say dialog. No, I could say form dialog, and then I know that there's a div oh, I see. and another div, and then an input type equals text. No, I think the right way to use this to look for the, uh, the input uh, in the form dialog. And it will pop up in Paris. It will faster uh, when it search the DOM object. Uh, yeah, I think it's Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I missed it. No, that's fine, that's fine. Seems like you just don't have to worry about having to level down. Right, because what is, let jQuery do the work, do the heavy lift, let it go and loop through everything and find the element that you're looking for. Which is better because let's say if you are gonna add one more div statement on top, Yes, it would. Yeah. Okay, um, here I'm finding all the text elements and clearing out their entries. I'm setting the check boxes and the radio buttons to have their check state to false. Here, I'm using an attribute as part of the selector. So I'm finding all inputs that are of type button whose value equals previous. And then I'm setting, I'm disabling them. I mean, I'm, in, I'm removing this, the disabled attribute. Well, does that mean it's going to be disabled? Uh, disabled is false, so it's enabled. Okay, so then I have this anchor tag with an ID of launch demo and I'm telling it oh I mean, I'm in the wrong spot. Where am I? Here. Here is that anchor tag. And this I did at old school. I just put in an on click event. I just show that there's there's different ways that you don't have to use jQuery to assign JavaScript events to your elements. You can do it this way as well. Okay, so when I launch the demo, I want to set some things up. Some things that are, I don't want to set up just when you go to the page. I want to do it when you're going to actually start using it. And the first one is get states. So that's the Ajax call that was in the um, the slides. And the reason I'm doing that is that, I mean, I'm only getting 50 states back, or 53, because it returns the territories as well. But if it was something that was going to be more heavy duty, and I'm not going to, I mean, they don't want to register. You know, load it if they're not going to use it. So wait until they need it before you do something like that. So the URL is like a 
service that it's calling? Mm, well, what it's doing is it's, in, in NBC at least, the, the main controller, the main, you know, your default is, is called the home controller. Yeah. So I'm just telling it, look in the home controller for the method called Arch. get states. Okay. And then it goes out and grabs from the SQL server the state. Right, or however you want to do yeah. it. <laughs> um, you know, here what I'm doing, I'm just, I just have a comma separated list and I'm doing a split on them. Yeah. I mean, I didn't want to have to, you know, make sure that my SQL server was up and running or get a web service of all the states. So I just hard coded this part in here. Wouldn't it be better to check in here if Ajax is enabled and then return JSON? Otherwise, you would return the. Uh, Mm. Because some, because it, it can be multi-purpose. This gets state. It can be used. true. True. Yeah, you could say you know what it was. It is Ajax request. Yeah, is branch and do this. Otherwise, yeah. do this. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is just short and sweet demo. I didn't need to do all of any of that kind of stuff. So I'm returning back JSON of the state list. What's doing is it's, it's generated into JSON and send it back to serve. Are you, who's using JSON as a data format? Cool. Who doesn't know what I'm talking about? JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and it's the, the latest way to send data back and forth between your client and your browser. Um, I'll show you some examples of what it looks like in a minute. But what it does is, if you run it, it, it just returns a string, a specially formatted string that you can read, and then when you call eval on it in JavaScript, boom, it converts it into an object that you can iterate and, and manipulate. Okay. Okay. Here I have a hidden field called form state that I'm setting the value to clean. On this one, I'm taking all elements that have a class name of validate, telling what to do when you blur on it and when you focus. And here I'm using that, that prop method to add a property to that element called valid. So when I do my validation, I know that it's if it's already valid, I don't have to check it again. Can you explain a little bit about the dot button on top? The oh, here? Yeah. That is a, um, a jQuery UI method, which goes and generates a, it stylizes your button based on the theme that you have. So if I comment this out, See, I just have a regular button. Uh huh? Uh -huh. So I'm sorry. Start over again. The MEC, uh huh. They have their own way to do the validation. Mm. And that's another way to do the validation through the JavaScript. So now, how do you like consolidate and to how how is two is work together? I mean, to to use like logic to share it into both places the same Well, let's see. I could use yeah. the baked the baked in validation, but you gotta validate on your client side to make sure it's you know you don't have to, but you should. You know, make sure it's a valid date, make sure it's a valid email address, make sure it's a valid credit card number. <coughs> then you gotta send that to your server and you in your server code you should validate it as well because something may have happened to that payload from the client to the server. But they're not really tied in together. So, so you mean that they have to some level to redundant quotation on both sides? That is correct. They should yes. be exactly the same way, if you can. Okay, so as part of the, the jQuery UI, widgets, they have a dialog box. 
and it has a bunch of options that you can use or that you can call. And what I'm doing here, I got div width. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm with another thing that in jQuery is that you can you can find other properties of your element. I mean, how wide is it? How tall is it? Does it have a scroll yet? You know, all that kind of stuff. So all I'm doing is I'm just getting the width of that dialog div and create a number so then I can pass it here, min width equals that. That way then if I if later on if I decide that I want to make it wider or thinner, I can just do that in the CSS and I don't have to go with my JavaScript code and change that. So the options, auto open is true. That means as soon as you click it, click the button or call this method, it's going to show the dialog box. Modal, you know, you can't do anything else on the page other than interact with it. You can set resizable to and false, blah, blah, blah. There's just a bunch of different options on the dialog. When you create, you can call some stuff. And when you open it, you can call some other stuff. Once you create a dialog box in jQuery, it stays in memory. So then you can just call the open again, and you don't have to go through all of this stuff. It just will show it and, and hide it. Is that part of jQuery UI? Yes. OK. So then. Um, I was fooling around a little bit with positioning it. That's not really there. Um, the dot close button, I want to close this dialog. So and that's all that does. Okay. So the next part is. going next and going previous. So let's look at this first div, step one. You can see here I'm using a data element to hold what the next step is going to be. So I'm on the first step, so next time I want to do is go to the second step. So instead of having to write a method that says go to step two, and then go to step three, and go to step four, I can just pass in this value here, and then I know where I'm at in my... Am I going too slow? Oh, great, okay. So what I'm doing, next step, I'm passing in what was clicked, which is that button. Um, let me In this method here, set next buttons. I'm finding all the inputs of type button whose value says next. Then I'm assigning a click handler to it of go form next. And this this is important because it passes the thing that was clicked to that method. So if we go back up here, this element, or this elem, is the thing that, that was clicked, the thing that called this method. So I'm going to find out what the next step is by checking up for data next dash step. Which you can see here. Then I'm finding what the next div is going to be, the next page of this wizard. And when we were talking about um, the selectors, you can say div dot class name or 
ID dot whatever. You can also concatenate by using some variables. So what that's going to do is it's going to find the, I, the div with an ID of DLG step plus X. So here I'm calling, I'm going to show the next, the second one, which is going to be DLG step two. So that's how I find that. What does data step Pardon? Data it's just a way to attach a bit of data to your element that then you can have access to later. So, so let's say if you have IE6, IE6 doesn't recognize data dash <laughs> what and things right. like that. So it wouldn't work with IE6. Right? <laughs> you can yeah. write Ajax with IE6. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, that's <laughs> yeah, but you know, there's still fax machines. Out there too. Um, well, then, you, if you know that you're going to be using I6, then you're going to have to do something else. Yeah. Well, so, modernizer will add some attributes to your elements that you can use. <laughs> yeah. Because the data dash came for IE7 and afterwards, or IE8? Mm, probably 8, because it's more of an HTML5. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm finding the steps that I want to, I mean the divs that I want to show, hide and show. Uh, I want to make sure that the val elements that need to be validated if, are validated before I go on. So like here, I haven't put in my, any of my information and I hit the next button and what it's doing is at first it's validating just this particular element on the page or in this dialog, the, the, the currently visible piece of the form. Um, if it's not valid, return false, don't go any further. Um, and then down here, I'm doing a fade out of a half a second on the current div. When that's done, then I'm doing, I'm fading in the next div. And if I wanted to add some more functionality, I could say function data, do this, do that, and all that kinds of stuff. So now, this is a good example of the each function. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm passing in the current div which would be DLG, in this case, DLG step one. So I want to get all of the elements that are in that current div that need to be validated. So I'm doing a dot find, everything with a class name of dot validate, but I don't want to have the password confirmation um, element in there. So I'm using the not. And so if we look here, So here is the first name field. It has a class of validate. I'm using the data attribute to pass in where I want to put the error message if I need to. And because I didn't want to write a big switch statement in JavaScript, I'm also using the, the data attribute called error message, error message of what do I want to tell the user. So, I get my collection of elements that I search for, and then I'm calling the each function. When you're looping through, it returns an object called this, which is the current element that has been selected in that loop. And how previously we talked about chaining and not calling dollar sign element, you know, to find it each time, to set a variable to that, to hold on to it. So I'm just saying dollar sign element equals this. So now I can do what I, all I have to do is just call dollar sign element. I don't have to search the DOM again to find it. So if it has a class called conditional, it's going to do another loop, and I'll show that in a second. 
Otherwise, it's going to get the, the value of that element. And if, it's, if, if there's nothing in there, then they didn't, it's not going to validate. Just set valid to false. Pardon? Why does the if statement, I guess that's just the syntax triple equals? In JavaScript, there's a, a, a thing called truthy and falsy. And, and so you have to use, really want to, you can use the equal equal. Uh -huh. But if you really want to make sure that it is because, um, just reading about this, zero, zero, zero equals 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 zero is true, but zero greater than zero returns true as well. Uh -huh. But if you said greater than equal equal, then okay. it's just a habit to get into when you're writing your JavaScript. Right. I'll remember that. Okay. Um, somebody else at the NW three twenty five I they left their, their lights on in the parking lot. What? If somebody owns a BMW 325 I, we'll have their lights on. Does it have a jump stop cable? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're about to ask Martin. So if he has a jump stop cable, then he's fine. So now. Uh, yeah. That was saying, Ellen, I think it's just a new convention. This is my, I can call it George if I want to. The double sign is just a new convention. No. Yes. No, the dollar sign. No, no, no. Here, where I'm sitting, var element. It could be a, an exclamation or a tilde or whatever or nothing. If, but what I do is, if I know I'm going to be working with this variable in a jQuery way, then I always put a dollar sign before. That way, I just know as I'm looking through my code. I could just say l elm and and do that. Like if I just want to get the value, or not the value, but uh, you know, if I want to do just something to that, nothing more. That's a good practice. I think they recommend to it. Pardon? I think the jQuery library recommends to mm -hmm. They recommend you, it's not mandatory, but they tell you to use us, try to do your variables to go or something. Okay. I'm not sure, but I think they do. I've seen a lot of people doing that. So we're still inside this each loop. So if it's not valid, if this element is not valid, then I want to find the status div that's associated with that element. Okay. So on first name, I'm, I have a div called first name dash status, which is what I'm passing in here and then getting here, okay? So again, I'm using, I'm concatenating all this stuff into the selector, so, all right? So basically this is gonna say dot first name status, okay? And then the error message I want to show again is a data element. And then I have a method to build the error message. So if we look here, you can see I have the, the, the text that's showing. I have a, a little icon there. So this is how I'm creating the element. Like in, in, in straight JavaScript, you can say document dot create element and then pass in the name of the tag that you want to use, a p, a, t, a, a div, whatever. And then from that variable, then you can say, you know, variable name dot inner HTML equals this, dot source equals that, blah, 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 blah. You can pass in a string to jQuery, and what it will do is it will create a div that has a span with this class in it, 
plus the message, and then close the div. And then it takes all that stuff, it builds it, and then puts it into the DOM for you. Um, so then I wanted to then do some manipulation here. And I wanted to do it this way. You're probably saying, well, why didn't you chain it? And I just I did it this way just to show that you don't have to chain. I mean, you can do it really however you want to. So I have my status div, I'm going to hide it, and then I'm going to empty it, get rid of all the elements that are inside. Then I'm going to append the div that I just created, and then I'm going to fade it in. Okay. Any questions so far? You guys want to take your break now? Yeah. Okay. Before we start, I just want to make one quick announcement. Um, we're getting the space uh, donated to us for free by Blank Spaces. So if this is your first time here, second time, if, if you haven't leave us uh, or gave them or give us a review, can you please do me a huge favor and just go on the website, go on Yelp, go on um, the Meetup, just put a positive review. It helps them with um, with their business and helps us get the space for free. So. Um, appreciate it. Just go on a meetup and you can just kind of click on the blank spaces or you can even add, add a review onto our, our meetup page. But it does help us in regards to getting more and more um, visibility in the marketplace. So, thanks. That's it. So, how much more time do I have? Uh, it's 30, 30 minutes. Should we do 45? 45 minutes? Okay. Well, we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Okay. Where were we? We opened the dialog. We did some validation. This is some conditional validation. So let me through. So if you notice here, I can click through and I don't get any validation. But if I put in something and then try to go, um, well, if you're putting in an address, you need a zip code, and if you want to put in, a, if you want to get, be notified when your when your package arrives, you need a phone number. So that's can I set that up to be conditional validation. It only validates if there's something in these other fields. And the code behind that is again, it's it's pretty much. Um, how I found everything else. I'm finding all the text inputs that don't have a class of conditional. So if you look here, on like the zip code and the phone number fields, I have a class of validate telling the system to validate it, and then I have a class called conditional. which only validate if something else happens. Okay. What else is there? Now, there's all kinds of ways to validate stuff. jQuery has a validation engine behind it. But I just wanted to write this just to show you. Do it. So I'm going to validate the element, um, which is done. All right, where did the code go? Here we go. 
when I go next, I'm going to validate the elements on leave page and I'm going to validate it. No, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. That validation is occurring on blur of that element. So right here, all elements that have a class name of validate, when you blur, when you tab out of it, or leave it for some reason, I'm going to validate the element and pass in this, which is the name of the, el the element that is being worked on. So it's blur like an on leave? Yes. Event or something? Oh, yes. okay. So it doesn't mean blur? No. Focus is when you tab into it. Blur is when you tab out. Okay. Or click into it and then click out of it. Okay. So this is, you know, what we've been talking about. This is pretty straightforward. I'm setting this variable called dollar sign element. Setting another variable called valid. Down here, I'm using the prop method to get the ID of that element. And then I have a switch statement. So email, phone number, and zip code, which maps to the IDs of these elements. I could do some, I you know, could set a another data data element or just an attribute or if it has a class name. Then if it's an email, I'll go down to validate the email, which someone asked me about regular expressions. Okay. So this is a regular expression that checks to see if it's a valid email address. You know, if it has a username and then an at sign and then a domain and then a top level domain. I mean, it's just a basic regular expression. Phone number, really simple. I'm just checking to make sure that it first it's not zero. The length of it, the string is not zero. Then I'm using a regular expression here to get rid of if they put any parentheses or dashes or stuff like that. Then I'm checking, I'm using, this is a JavaScript function, is not a number. If, if, I, if there's any characters in that string, then is NAN will be true, because it's not a number. And then I'm checking to see how long that string is. I mean, phone numbers here in the United States are only 10 digits. So if it's, if it's a number and it's 10 digits long, return true. Validate the password. Just checking to make sure that both password values are the same. Zip code is again the same. Check and make sure it's a number, make sure it's five. I mean, there's all kinds of other ways that you can do your validation on this stuff. So now, as we go through, Make my other selections and choose all of those. Choose this one. Say next. And so now here's the confirmation page. So what it's what it's done is it's gone and it's get it's has gotten all the information that I posted in those elements. And then it's creating strings to display. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm calling this jQuery function called serialize array, which goes and 
gets all the elements in the form, and then creates a JSON object. Let me show that to you. Can you make the text a little larger? Uh, I hope so. Let's see here. How's that? Is that better? Is that better? Okay, so remember I was talking earlier about <laughs> developing with jQuery and you know it fails gracefully if, if something goes wrong. So what I use is Firebug, which is an add-in for Firefox. And it's a really good JavaScript debugger. I like using it better than the Microsoft developer tools and Internet Explorer. But if we look at this line, I'm setting a variable called form values. So here's my selector, and then I'm saying serialize, serialize array. And I get this object back. So first name, the name is first name, the value is James. Here, I selected the yes radio button for privacy. I check the box for contact by, by email. In HTML, if the checkbox is not ticked, then you get nothing back. I don't know if you knew that or not. Um, so don't expect contact email to be off if you didn't check the box. Question, uh, the serialization only works for element of type form or? Uh... Mm. Or regardless, you probably could pass in a div that had other elements in it, but it works on inputs and selects. Yeah. Okay. Well, and then I'm just setting a new array, going through each of those, and then building the confirmation page. jQuery has a lot of um, cool low-level utilities and functions that you can use. So if we look at this array here, I mean, it's not your typical array. It's an array of arrays. <coughs> so what I want to do here is from this array, this object, it's called form values, I want to find what the value of first name is. And I didn't want to loop through and check, you know, if element, you know, dot value equals first name, you know, all that kind of stuff. So jQuery has this cool function in here called grep. And what's really neat about it is that you pass in the array that you want to check. Then you write a function with some parameters in there. So what I'm saying is from this array, find the element where the name equals the value to find. So if we go back up, I want to find the first name. So what it does is it goes through the array that you passed in and it filters. It only returns what you ask for. So if we look at this, what's going to happen, let me just step into it here. Okay, so if we look at form values, you can see it's got 21 objects in it. I'm just going to run past that code. And now if we look at form values, 
it only has one object in it, the thing that I was searching for. So it, it modifies that array that you pass in, but only gives you the things that you were looking for. The value type has to be simple that they cannot be compared, can they? For using this prep function? Uh, like for example, simple type, I mean like string or int or uh, mm -hmm. it, it cannot be an object. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know if you could do that. This example here is just checking the string, yes. comparing the two strings. Never had a reason to do that. I'll have to look into that. Let's see. Um, so I get all the first names up down to phone number. And now, because okay, now we're back at, at form values. And in the case of checkboxes, so like contact email, the value is on. And I don't want to show on, I want to show yes, you clicked the button, or no, you, you didn't click the button. So I have this other function called format checkbox value, where I'm passing in what the value is, on or null or popcorn. So if it's null, I'm returning no, otherwise returning yes. And then I'm going to format the phone number. This is just another JavaScript function to take the phone number, which is just numbers, and then put in, you know, print it up, parentheses and dash. And then once I get all of that information, I just pass in, I mean, I call this other method. And I just did this real quick and dirty because I was running out of time, but I knew that the first index in values array is going to be the first thing. The second one's going to be the last thing. So I just concatenate the two to create the name and just continue on down the list. And I mean, if you look, I see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you know, blah, 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 6, 7, 8. There's other ways that you could do that as well. You know, searching through the array for whatever. And then, on step five, the confirmation step, I laid it out and then I have a span with an ID attached to it of confirmed name or confirmed email or address or phone or whatever. So I'm finding the span that has an ID of confirmed name and setting its HTML to this value. Now maybe you're wondering why I said span hashtag confirm name instead of just hashtag confirm name. It's just one thing I have found is for two, two things is that if you tell it span and then the ID, it's a little bit faster because first it goes and it gets just all the spans. Then it loops through and it finds the one with that ID. Secondly, if I'm looking at this JavaScript code here, I know that the span is going to be modified. I know that it's a span. I know it's not a text box, it's not a button, it's not a, you know, an image or anything like that. Just a little trick that I do. What the thing is, if later on you change the span to a D, then you have to come and change the code. Right. In this case. Yeah. Versus the other way, you don't have to. True. No, it's you know six of one, half dozen of the other. How, however, you're more productive. Okay. So then I'm building this confirmation page, and that's what you see. Here. 
Okay. Now, another thing is so I'm going through and I'm going to decide I'm going to close this. And now I have another field that's called um, form state and it has two values, either dirty or clean. When you first launch the dialog box, the value is clean. As soon as you start doing something with these elements, it sets it to dirty. So then if I go to close the main dialog, it checks and then it tells me, oh, you got unsaved changes, are you sure you want to close it? Now this, these buttons here, they're not in the DOM anywhere. I mean, they're not in the, the source of the page. As we can see here, this is the close confirmation div. You have unsaved changes, are you sure you want to close this form? There's no button in there. One of the options for building a dialog box is to, of course I have to find the code. <coughs> is when I'm creating the dialog, so I'm passing in the name of the, the div or the element that, wants, that I want to turn into a dialog box. I'm telling it that I want it to be modal. Then I'm setting up buttons. And if you look here, these are just objects, JavaScript objects itself, okay? So I'm setting up a collection of buttons to display. This is the text to show. Then this is are these are the events that are going to happen when you click it. So in the case of yes, I want to hide the little confirmation dialog, and then I want to hide the main dialog. Otherwise, I just want to hide the confirmation dialog. Are you limited only to the type button or you can actually have for the yes no confirmation like for example images and things like that? Mm, it's not it's not a specific option where you could do that. But in jQuery what you could do is go in and and modify that. You could, through jQuery, you could go and you could manipulate that before it shows. You know, to swap things out. How do you set the dirty Um, let's see. Here. Here's my hidden element called form state. And then here, I'm finding all input text fields in the dialog. And then on blur, I'm setting a toggle form state. Go a little further, on focus, I have another function called set original value. So if we look at toggle form state, or set original value, let's do that one first. What I'm doing is, is I'm getting the value that's already entered in that, that field, and using the data attribute, called, and I'm setting it called original value to what that is. So then if you go back and you change it, if I change James to Jim, well then I know I made a change. So it's going to say you don't have saved changes, or you haven't saved your changes. 
because the validation isn't going to work because it has a value. You know, for all intents and purposes, it is a valid argument, but you made a change. Okay, so then the last part. So if you just change the checkbox, you haven't edited any any uh, text box. You change the check state of the checkbox to register it as dirty. Not in this code because I didn't. You were just looking at the input. The text yeah, box. at the text fields. But I could say you know um, find checkbox and then on click. You know I could do the same thing. So now the last part is submitting the form. Okay, so I have again this, in, this hidden input called demo state, and for right now, I have it set to false. So if I'm in demo mode, or if I'm not in demo mode, then I'm gonna run this code. Otherwise, I'm gonna run this code. So let's step through this. I didn't want to send anything off to the server. I just want to show you what's being sent to the server. So I'm getting, the, I'm finding the dialog form, and then I'm calling serialize array. And then I'm hiding the content of the page. Div called form values. It has two other divs in it. The last one's called submitted form values. So I'm setting the HTML of that div to um, a JSON string. I'm sorry? No, that's um. The modern browsers have that that functionality built into it. It's not a jQuery thing. JSON JSON dot stringify. The way it does is it takes everything, and you. I mean, at first maybe you're looking at this, and you're kind of okay. What's what am I seeing here? But these are all the elements of that form in JSON format. So this is one of those elements, I mean one of those those values. Remember the array that we were looking at? That's gone. You know, but the, the the name was first name and the value was James. So then the next one is last name, Johnson, you know, just stepping through. So when you ask for JSON to come back from the server. Like how I do here on the state list. It comes back in a format similar to this. Yes? You want a literal quotation mark in your value. Are there state sequences in this format? Mm -hmm. Just standard JavaScript escape sequences. I believe it's backslash backslash. No, that would be a good thing to see what it comes back as. Can you try a double quote?
So much me. What if you have 13, 13 pounds, what half, and, do, and two, and two, no, it's a pound and a column. And a column. And columns? No, a column. Whole one? <laughs> Great, I remember when I cry. <laughs> That's good. Where were Okay, so that turned out okay. Okay, so single quotes come back as straight text. Let's see there. It looks like they all come back because they're in uh, in the quotes, the double quotes. On the end of the third line. Double quotes come back. Oh, yeah. Yep, yeah, there you go. Yeah. You've got to escape. So that's it. Excuse me, uh, that grab function that you use mm -hmm. uh, is efficient way of doing it because you could just traverse through that JSON anyway and get all the elements you want. You could. It faster than doing grab, 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 grab. Again, it's, it's just a matter of how you feel when you're writing it. I mean, if you, <laughs> if you want to loop through all those elements, like if I wanted to, I could. Just checking to see what the name was of each one. Um, it just seemed to me at the time that the grep function was was better. Okay. An easier way to do it. Okay. Um, I think that is it for me to show. Can you show the JSON that the that JSON that you spit out? Can we make that get request just in the browser, like you have it running? No, the one that brings back the states. Oh, I see what We should be able to. Yeah. Slash home slash get states. There you go. That's how it's coming back. <coughs> Okay, let's see here. Let's finish up. Demos. jQuery UI. Um, so it's built on jQuery. It supports all the modern browsers. You get a bunch of widgets and effects and all kinds of stuff, and you can theme it. Yeah, it's, it should remove that six on Microsoft. It's supporting it, I think, for sure. It's not a modern browser, also. Hey, I at work I still have to support 6.0. So I don't think Microsoft will do it. I think they dropped it. They officially, dropped, yeah, they officially dropped, dropped it. it. 6.0 okay. is not supported. They no longer support it because only X percent the percentage of people worldwide using it is too small to, to be concerned with it. It's good to know. They do 7.0 and up. So you can drag, drop, resize, you can select. The widgets themselves are pretty cool, you know, from accordions to sliders and tabs. We already talked about autocomplete and dialogue. This is how you set up your autocomplete. We talked about that. There's some other options. The delay is how long from when they start typing to when it gets triggered. And min length is how many characters they have to put in before it gets triggered. Um, date picker is an easy way to show a calendar. Uh, question. Uh -huh. On the autocomplete, I was trying, for example, if I have so many elements, I just wanted to control the size of autocomplete with a scroll bar. I couldn't figure that out with jQuery, is there any way that we, we would say maximum size of the display would be this many pixels, so automatically if anything else would go inside with a scroll bar? 
I don't know off the top of my head, I have to look at the options on the site. I struggled with it, but I couldn't find it. that you can trigger into, you know, like when they select something, you know, when they go out of the field, when they show it, I mean, what you want to show, all kinds of stuff on the date trigger. Hey, they have a pre-show. Um, <clears throat> I put the date trigger, the date trigger, and then somehow it comes to be the CSS part. But the, the always a configure with the existing CSS. <clears throat> It will be a to be for example, day pickers when it, when you go and see demo, like it's just a this small size and mm -hmm. nice little. But as soon as I you know put into my website, already I have already defined all the elements in CSS, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So somehow it you know completes it is look back a little all that. So you have to include the, if you're using the jQuery widgets, you have to include the pure, I, I include the, the CSS comes with it. One of the, 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 their own, their theme CSS yeah. files. Yes, but somehow, because they, each one, they, for example, each like a TV or whatever, uh -huh. they didn't make as an important. Basically, it's not like a final. Oh, I see. Thing. Okay. So it conflicts with the if you, for example, TV you define it, you know, the home test is kind of a little bigger. Uh -huh. It overrides and make it ugly. And I see that common. So what's a kind of the recommended practice? Like yeah, you Find could overwrite the classes. Um, Find the conflict in the you may want to check the the order in which you're loading your CSS. If you have, if do you have multiple CSS files, mm -hmm. you might want to try rearranging the order that they're loaded. Oh, I see. I because have. maybe something in another CSS file is is overwriting something that the date picker needs. So, <coughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you're welcome. Um, team space. That one. This one you need to include at least if you're using any of the widgets, or you know if you're only going to use a date picker, then you could just use the date picker CSS file. So that one. If you want, if the users go into TBS, your website, and then the jQuery like this, the reference to it, where it says HCTV docs.jQuery.com, this picker, that is no longer it's secure. Well, first off, this is just a comment. This is just telling you where to go to get. way to secure JavaScript. Yeah, yeah. With JavaScript, it's on the client. They can look at it. You can unify it. You can obfuscate it. Uh, so you will have the keys in the JavaScript. So I just have to find the keys and do the decryption like you're doing. So there is no way to see. There is a way to try to make it more difficult. But if you execute everything on the client side, I have it. Just minify the hell out of it. 
Yeah, I mean, they what they do, they scramble at the log, so it's very really difficult to read and figure it out, which is good enough. No, what you're saying, they're saying I, if you're sending data back and forth to a server, okay, and it's not. No, you can't hide the code. Like, you can't, like, it's open source by its nature because no, it runs no, on the client. Yeah, because yeah. it's on the client. So you <laughs> The only thing what you can do, they do that, just scramble it and make it really mm -hmm. concurrent, and that's extreme, that's almost impossible to do. But you can discramble it. They do no, that. but I'm just saying if a person um, wants to, to um, browse the web securely, like you can do on Facebook or HTTPS, colon, ah. and that thing where they want a secure browsing environment. Are you saying, did they, did they have the CDN over SSL? I don't think they do. No, that, that, that no, because you can't, no, you can't cross-browse the, the JavaScript. So you won't let you. I let the other developers worry about security. I just write the front end. I'm just saying, you know, I have a question. That is one of your things. Is, that, I know that you Jason mean. that you had, is there a way that you can turn it into an object like, uh, object like a custom object or, this, or whatever that form was? You can create an object and just transform it into the object so that you can get... In C-sharp? No, no. No. Get the JavaScript object. object. Like you could create a, let's say, registration object mm -hmm. that has all this information in it mm -hmm. and just transform it from... Is there, a, is there a thing that you can transform it for just one single instruction? What he, you showed you showed Well, when the serialize array, that... Th this method here. No, that's going to a JSON, coming from a JSON to populate an object. Back to the object. So Back you to an object. object. Like you have your fork. How oh, eval does that? Uh huh. Eval will, will create the the object, but jQuery behind the scenes does that as well. So, so that's, that's what he was looking like. What what's the line that you'd write? Say var my object equals and you grab mm -hmm. the JSON that gets the how do you get the uh, show how do you do the states the states become an object eh? don't they? Yeah. You, yeah you make yeah them. it comes back as yeah it's it's no, you get a JSON but you, you can as you a use string it, you use it, it as a string. string yeah but you use it as an object where is the no the string is the object that it can hey, that would be the better way to do that if, if, instead of doing the graph, I, I think. Well, this, you know, that's that's a very simple no, JSON. All it is is the line. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I think it's or yeah. do you want to say, can you send JSON back to the server and then do processing no, on that? No, 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 no. Like when that. you get from the server a JSON, like you get from the server Everything like an entire can. object mm -hmm. which has a bunch of properties, a complex object, yeah, not I just something. I, I think they are looking for data that contains vessel or an object. So you just use registration dot first name, registration dot last name. So oh, oh, I see. okay, okay. So therefore, you don't have to do correct. This serializer for like, oh, oh, true, here. true. Yeah. When you um, success the data, you know, the uh, variable, the passed by from the server. Mm -hmm. When your data are contents, mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure, but the, it has to then. You have to. It's, a, it's already object. Yes, I know, but you have to define your registration object first, and then you can transform it. Mm -hmm. That way, you don't have to do the graph. I don't see what's right now. Interesting. <coughs> oh, great. I like Yeah, I know. I, hate, you know. I got to test something on the last page, you know.
Can you type just A in a state you want to try to see something? If there is, yeah, just A. Like he, he want, yeah, he wants to make this one signal yeah. only this, yes. to make it like only three of them, mm -hmm. and with a slider on the side. Uh, I'm sure you could do that, because all this is is just a, a div with a, an unordered list in there. I struggled so much to find him. Who built the hell out of this? Well, why do you need that? <laughs> no, but why do you need that? Yeah, because I have a long list and I have a small portion. So yeah, I but the idea is that you keep typing. And you keep so typing, the list will get smaller and smaller. Okay. For example, three letters. It might be a long list because it's really big from the I don't have no control. So what I could to work on your thing, so I can say form values and then the index and then say name. Yeah. And that gives you first name last name, yeah? Well that gives me I just thought that you see I have two elements in that object. I have name and value. I mean, if I knew that this form, this array was going to map directly to what I wanted to display, I could just go through a loop of this and, and get the name and the value and, and do something with that. source code to Michael and um, he'll get it to you however he does is put on a link or is he send you 600 megabytes on your email. I can put it on my website too. Just put a link there? Yes. Uh, I can do that. Like if you go to my blog at latringo.me, um, no, I can put a link to it there. Okay. Are you sure that's correct, or is there a typo in that URL? Isn't that your slide share? Like, nah, it's one of these funky um, <laughs> URL or domain hacking things. <laughs> that's, <laughs> not, <laughs> that's not. That's not. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, to maximize the window of a uh, slide when it's first open, what's the best way to determine, I guess, screen dimensions? You could check the CSS width and height properties of the body tag. Okay. That wouldn't tell you the size of the screen, right. the monitor. The, yeah, we could decide the monitor, but it tell you it's 100%, I guess. No, yeah. he I would rather you have it like that small on such a big screen. Right. Um, <laughs> I've never had to do that before. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head how you check. Why do you need that? Because I can think, sadly, some of the development tools I have to use um, have a prepackaged uh, form size. And when that form window opens, the browser window opens, instead of having it, they, they've made it so it's um, optimized for 1020 uh, by 764. Uh, but if someone has a bigger monitor, I want to be able to have that window at maximum size and not limited to, I guess, a default of 1024 by 768. I think the easiest way is to just create a dummy object and then 
insert the pin to the bottom pad and use the uh, width and height hundred percent. And after that, you can get the hundred percent of the width and height of the window. Then you remove the pin pad and then just get it every time. Brand fresh, and then you just remove the pin pad afterward. That will be uh, more easy instead of you tabulating it. Okay, so. I'm trying to see how you could set it. You could try, you know, window, like what's shown here is wrap window in, in the jQuery selector and then dot width equals 100%, or not equals, but dot width, and then here you would pass in 100%, see if that works. Okay. So I'm done. Any other questions? Okay. Mike's right here someplace. Because he has prices. <laughs> yeah, he abandoned us. Watching bus uh, uh, And if you're ever in San Bernardino on the second Tuesday of the month, yeah, yeah, yeah. stop on by.